I think we can all agree that this confrontation between Gandalf and the Balrog is one of the greatest cinematic achievements of all time. It might even be the greatest cinematic achievement of all time. It is, after all, the pivotal moment in one of the greatest films ever made and one of the greatest stories ever told. This channel is all about looking under the hood of great stories and figuring out what makes them tick. And Fellowship of the Ring uses a few tricks that you might never have noticed, even if you know the film really well, which I'm sure you do. So let's take a closer look at what Gandalf and the Balrog have to teach us about the art of storytelling. So let's start by putting the scene in its dramatic and narrative context. Where does it fit in the bigger story? The Fellowship of the Ring follows a classic three-act dramatic structure, and the scene with the Balrog happens right here at the end of Act 2, which is usually a major turning point in a story. The first act of the film ends when Frodo arrives in Rivendell. At that point in the story, he has triumphed over the antagonists of the first act, but his character has changed in a fundamental way. In Rivendell, Frodo gets a new call to action, which is to take the ring all the way to Mordor to destroy it. And this gives us the dramatic question of the whole trilogy. Will Frodo succeed in destroying the ring and overcoming the temptation to evil? Now the second act begins when the Fellowship leaves Rivendell, and it ends when the Balrog defeats Gandalf. Now the screenwriters have an interesting challenge here because the climax of the second act doesn't directly involve Frodo. It's not Frodo versus the Balrog. It's Gandalf versus the Balrog. And that means it's not Frodo who's the main character of the second act. It's Gandalf. If you're not convinced, then let's look at some of the writing and editing decisions that the filmmakers use here. And what I'd really like to call your attention to is their very skillful use of foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is when the narration of a story provides a hint about a future event in the plot. The most cited example is actually from Romeo and Juliet, in which it is said in the prologue, from forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. So yeah, spoiler alert, Romeo and Juliet die at the end of that play. Now a reasonable person might ask, why give away the ending? Why not save it till the end? And the answer is that knowing the ultimate fate of our main characters makes their doomed romance all the more tragic to watch while you're watching it, rather than after you've watched it. This type of foreshadowing is very direct, but it can also be more subtle. In The Empire Strikes Back, when Luke Skywalker has a vision of his own face behind Darth Vader's mask, you're not being told exactly what's going to happen in the plot. It's just priming the audience for the idea that Luke's conflict is ultimately more of an internal one. And this is important because if the audience doesn't know that his conflict is internal, then the climax of his story won't have the same dramatic tension. I think a good analogy for foreshadowing is a roller coaster because we sometimes think that, you know, the essential part of the ride is the drop. But if you've ever ridden a roller coaster, you know that the climb to the top is also an essential part of the experience and there's a huge thrill in looking down from the top and seeing how far you're going to fall. Okay, so with that in mind, let's look at Fellowship of the Ring. Now, the very first thing that happens at the beginning of the second act is that Gimli pitches Gandalf on the idea of going through the mines of Moria, to which Gandalf ominously replies, I would not take the road through Moria unless I had no other choice. You'll notice Gandalf doesn't say why he doesn't want to go through the mines of Moria, but a seed has been planted in your mind. There's something dangerous lurking in those mines, and only Gandalf seems to know about it. Our next clue comes when the Fellowship tries to cross over the mountains, and of course, the fact that this road is safer than the mines implies something about the danger that is in Moria. Eventually, the Fellowship realizes they can't go this way, and here the filmmakers do something really interesting. They use the character of Saruman to reveal an artist's rendition of the thing that Gandalf's scared of. I remember the first time I saw this film in theaters, I was surprised that they revealed an image of the Balrog here. You know, I'd read the books and I was anticipating the reveal of the Balrog in the Mines of Moria. I thought it was strange that they gave it away at this point, but if you're thinking in terms of dramatic tension, then it makes perfect sense. So Gandalf lets Frodo make the call and then we get this extreme close-up on Gandalf that really shows his fear about going in the mines. The Journey Through the Mines is one of the best sequences in the whole trilogy, and it's actually Peter Jackson's favorite, which is interesting. The piles of rotting carcasses are also foreshadowing, of course. But the dramatic tension really spikes here, right after our heroes defeat the troll in Balan's tomb. 
And again, this surprised me the first time I saw the film because they just had a big victory and then they're immediately surrounded by goblins. And so it felt a bit anticlimactic. But of course, it's all part of Peter Jackson's carefully laid plan and it's all just to set up this pivotal dramatic beat. The film has been teasing this moment for the entire second act and it's like, okay, now the roller coaster is perched right at the top of the track and it's just waiting for the drop. And that drop happens precisely when Gandalf says, Run! And you know, my stomach just dropped the first time I saw that in theaters. Such an exciting moment. You know, the fact that Gandalf had to run away really said a lot. Now there's another very subtle bit of foreshadowing that happens right here that I really like that I didn't catch the first time I saw the film. Lead them on, Aragorn. The bridge is near. When Gandalf says, lead them on, he's not just saying, lead them to the bridge. He's saying, lead them on after I'm gone. He already knows he's going to have to sacrifice himself. And that's why Aragorn looks a bit confused, like even he doesn't really understand the nature of the threat. Then we get the famous collapsing staircase scene, and we get another close-up reaction shot of Gandalf, again just showing that he's really the character that we're following here. You know, Gandalf gets a lot of reaction shots in Act 2 of the film, and I think that really shows you that the filmmakers are thinking about Gandalf as the main character here. You know, they would cut to Frodo if Frodo was the main character, but the Balrog isn't coming for Frodo, it's coming for Gandalf, and the filmmakers are showing you that, albeit very subtly, with their editing choices. And that brings us at last to the Bridge of Casa Doom, the climax of the second act, and we return to our original question. Why is this scene so emotionally satisfying? You know, there's a funny thing about this scene. If you think about it, there really isn't much of an epic battle going on here. Like if you compare it to Obi-Wan and Anakin dueling at the end of Revenge of the Sith, they were sword fighting for 12 minutes. By comparison, there's not much action here. I think the Balrog hits Gandalf with his sword one time. So why does it feel like the most epic confrontation ever put on film? Well, I think the answer is that this scene was very consciously and meticulously foreshadowed throughout the entire second act. And what you feel when you watch this scene is the release of all that built up dramatic tension. It's because the threat of the Balrog has been growing in the back of your mind for the last 45 minutes of the movie. And because Peter Jackson has done the work of gradually raising the stakes to this level, he's then justified in treating Gandalf's death with the full mythic grandeur that it deserves. So if we zoom out and look at the entire story, we get a sense of the purpose of Act Two of Fellowship of the Ring. Frodo has witnessed the death of his friend and guide, and seen that even the most powerful among us may succumb to the forces of evil. And that's really the moral of the story of Act Two. Frodo's character has changed irrevocably, and the dramatic question about whether he can defeat evil and destroy the ring is now much more complicated than it was when he left Rivendell. And that means that if Frodo succeeds in destroying the ring, it's an even greater testament to the qualities of his character. And thus, the filmmakers will have made a much more profound artistic and moral statement in their telling the story of Frodo and the ring. So a lot of credit is due to these writers for adapting Tolkien's story for the big screen. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. Please subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you on the next one.